शेयर बटन कहाँ पर आएगा नीचे हेलो एंड वेलकम टू द सेकंड इंटरेक्शन सेशन ऑफ द एन पी टेल कोर्स ऑन लाइटर देन एयर सिस्टम्स so uh, i do have a very interesting and a timely presentation to show you but before that i would like uh, to request the teaching assistant mr namanuddin to type out any major queries or questions that the students have already expressed which he is not able to handle after we take your queries then i am going to share with you an interesting perspective so naman you can type the queries which are relevant and uh, important very good evening so naman we are waiting for you yeah uh the first question uh, is about the possibility of directing and controlling a hot air balloon in the desired direction with any propulsion system yes it is possible and uh, we will talk about it in more detail because i am going to talk to you about the recent incidents in which a chinese balloon was spotted over canadian and us territory and also over the andaman and nicobar islands in india and uh, when we talk about that at the end of that i'm going to address this question uh, by felimon mina about uh, the possibility of directing a hot air balloon a question by Janendra Kumar Sinha is can we implement two or three Savonius wind turbines for self power generation uh, the answer is yes in fact we are working on one such proposal today i had a meeting with one private agency who is interested to fund a prototype of a turbine mounted below an aerostat envelope to generate electrical power using the wind and we also thought that why only one turbine why can't we provide two three turbines one below the other so that all of them can generate power which can be added together there are issues regarding the stability of the balloon and the envel and the and the tether or the cable there is also an issue regarding how much payload an envelope can carry because each turbine is going to have quite a large weight in our studies we found that the smallest wind turbine available in the market today is about 6.8 kilograms and if i am not correct if i am not wrong it gives about um how much about i am forgetting about 100 watts of power so one way is to put a large turbine which can generate more power or you can put a family or group of turbines the question is from janendra kumar sinha who is an mtech student working on real time data transfer and surveillance in oil field as for good endurance he is trying to implement seven years wind turbine he needs my help and guidance uh the first comment i want to make is that a savonius wind turbine is basically a vertical axis wind turbine and it is known from our 
literature search that vertical axis wind turbines are very poor efficiency. <clears throat> they have very poor efficiency as compared to the horizontal axis wind turbines. <clears throat> Estimates range from 30 to 40 percent. That means the efficiency is 30 percent or 40 percent lower. So, Janendra, I would strongly recommend that you consider looking at the horizontal axis wind turbine. Uh, but we did some studies on VAWT or vertical axis wind turbines, like a seven years rotor turbine. And uh, we did some CFD analysis of what happens, how to make it self sustaining, what is the cutoff speed, etc. All that is going to be presented by us in the form of a paper in a forthcoming conference happening in the month of June in the USA on lighter than air systems. It is the AIAA Aviation Forum. We have one paper in that. But I will be happy to coordinate with you offline so you can get my contact details from Namanuddin, my email address, if you don't have it already. Send a mail to me and then we'll have a meeting online. We will discuss what your requirement is. We have decided to shift away from a Savonius rotor wind turbine to a horizontal axis wind turbine. And I believe such turbines are ready-made available in the country. We came across a company based in Pune, which is not very far from Mumbai. But I believe there are other companies also. So, we have decided to shift to horizontal axis wind turbines. But you are welcome. Aditya Bharadwaj has a very interesting question. How relevant is this course to current world? I'm afraid that there is no scope beyond the course. No, Aditya, you are wrong. There is a lot of application of LTS systems in real life, which can be implemented or tested out. And that is why we started this course, because this subject is relatively new. Many people don't know about it. So to help people get an idea about the positives and limitations of LTA systems. We have started this course. There is definitely relevance. For example, I was, I'm just talking right now about using wind turbines mounted below the aerostat to generate electrical power. We can also think of putting solar panels on top of the envelope or a conformal solar panel which can match with the contour of the envelope and with a, such a large surface area, you can generate solar power. There are also many applications of LTA systems for aerial surveillance, for product promotion, advertisement, for uh, providing communication in remote areas. Anything that requires low speed or no speed in the case of aerostat, and very poor, very limited operating cost after you deploy the system and extremely high endurance, then LTA systems become a probable candidates. Of course, they are not all weather systems. So therefore, you cannot deploy them under all circumstances. Their dispatch reliability is poorer as compared to other aeronautical systems. But still, No system is fully capable and also available 24-7 under all weather conditions. So there are definitely applications, certain niche applications where LTS systems can be used. Also, the current uh, studies all over the world are in the area of what is called as cargo airship. These are huge payload carrying vehicles which are planned to be traversing across the countryside. Some companies all over the world have already made small prototypes and they are waiting for funding to make a big prototype. But definitely, I see a good future for LTA systems and it is important that you are aware of the system and its merits and demerits right in the beginning. You do not start learning about LTA systems only when some demand arises. You are ready and knowledgeable even before you enter the market. So yes, I think there is enough scope. Vidushi Mittal has a question regarding how to get to work on a project with you, that is with me, 
related to LTA systems and how to get internships in Agra DRD or lab. So there are two questions here about internships in IIT Bombay to work with me and about internships in ADRD Agra. Now let me answer the second question first. To get internship in Agra DRD or lab or ADRD Agra, you need to know somebody in that lab because there is no official mechanism or a proper set procedure through which internships are going to be offered. It is all based on personal connections and uh, personal relations. So if you know somebody who either works in ADRD Agra or knows somebody and puts in a word, there might be a chance that ADRD Agra might open its doors and give internships to you. Sometimes DRDO labs also run some special internship schemes. So just watch their website for details. Vidush is now coming to the possibility and the procedure to work in IIT Bombay with me as an intern. Again, there are two streams here. One stream is, there are actually three streams, sorry, not two. The first scheme is called as IRCC Research Internship Scheme, in which students are encouraged to apply and sign up for projects being conducted in IIT Bombay with the professors for internship. So there is a formal procedure for this. You can do this in your seventh semester or eighth semester. Generally, the IRCC Research Internship in IIT Bombay is announced somewhere in the month of August. Then you apply in September. Interviews are held in October or mid-November. And then after that, you can, if you are selected, you can start from 1st December or you can start from 1st January. So this particular scheme, it gives you a monthly stipend of rupees 15,000 and plus there is some money for contingencies and purchases, etc. And uh, you have to apply for the projects that have been uploaded by the professor. Each professor is allowed to upload three projects, but the funding is available only for one project. So most of us give one proposal and we ask people, uh, we have to ask the students to read the problem statement, see if they meet the requirements, apply to us. This is the first way. The second way of getting internship with me in IIT Bombay is through this course of NPTEL. And sitting right next to me is uh, an intern who had topped the LTA systems course last year. And therefore, NPTEL has offered him internship for uh, about three months. And uh, he was paid 6,000 rupees a month stipend for his internship. And he was officially allowed to visit IIT Bombay and work with me. Uh, he has come back to work uh, with me for another 10 days because a technical paper based on his work has been accepted for an international conference in June in USA. So he wants to give the final shape to his paper and also work on some other interesting uh, competition which is going on. Many of you must be knowing about the competition called ERDD that we are conducting, the Emergency Rapid Deflation Device Competition. So he is one of the team members of a particular college, Chaitanya College. So the, the third way of coming for internship is to approach through our institute on the, there is a web page for internships in IIT Bombay. And these are IIT Bombay research internships. This is different from IRCC internship because in IRCC internship, you are supposed to do a mini PhD. And in these other internships about which I was just mentioning to you, you can work on any topic that you feel is interesting for you and suitable for the guides, experience and supervision. And there are different kinds of things that people do. This internship is available for three months. And it is also a small funded internship of 2,000 rupees a month. 
that is the the third internship is uh, through external uh, program you have to look at the website of iit bombay there is a academics office web page on that you will find a link for doing external projects or summer internships uh, for that there is a fee to be paid to iit bombay if i remember correctly the fee is rupees 25000 for a 6 month undergraduate activity and 15000 i think for uh, the internship without any formal association or degree so now the floor is open you may ask your queries now otherwise we will go ahead and discuss the topic about which i spoke in the beginning about the chinese balloon floating over america yes please as naman has said the floor is open to online learners you may write your queries or and uh, that will be taken up by me one by one okay so as per naman suggestion we will start with the presentation so let me just share my screen and show you uh, the presentation okay you must have heard recently uh, about this particular uh, problem um chinese claim that it's a surveillance balloon sorry they claim that it's a it's a weather balloon or a civilian balloon which has gone astray whereas the us believe that it's a surveillance balloon so a few days ago on 21st february i was invited by the american institute of aeronautics and astronautics los angeles and las vegas chapter to share my thoughts on this which is what i am going to share with you also so we will talk about lta systems and balloons all of you are aware of them because you are all members of this course we will look at the sequence of recent events and aftermath of the incidents other ufo sightings i will talk about balloons versus satellites and you must have heard that ultimately it was fired by an aim 9x sidewinder missile and many people are wondering why they have to use a missile and in the end finally we will look at the takeaways from this incidents both for usa china as well as for india so you know that lta systems are the ones that use buoyancy to overcome gravity there are many lta gases as you all are very much aware and uh, after the initial studies of aviation when airships were ruling the skies they went into the oblivion they hibernated somewhere around late 30s early 40s because of a series of disasters and accident that took place prominent among them was the hindenburg disaster in us followed by ekron nekon rh101 etc so somewhere in 1980s after a hiatus of around 50 years interest in lta systems was revived because of a very interesting and challenging project proposed by the us armed forces who were looking for a very long endurance up to a month environment friendly solution which is quiet also which is aimed to protect the commercial fleet so it should be flown alongside this particular fleet so that they don't feel alone and it can be used to protect the interests of this particular community for example if some ship comes to hijack or to overpower the people there was a plan to 
build a palatial palace or take the balloon up and then you know there was some talk about going back into time and allowing people to be safe this is a very very fast emerging discipline because there are lots of new projects and ideas every day we get to know of some new project which is happening as far as the working is concerned this slide is not new to you so i'm going to actually skip much of it but you know for example that uh, the lta systems suffer mainly from two things being slow and large in size hence more susceptible to weather changes otherwise they are all green whereas heavier than air systems are all red as far as aerostatic lift is concerned as far as the fuel efficiency is concerned and the complexity is concerned but they are very fast and they also are less susceptible to weather changes and hence they are more popular you know that the three principal lta systems are the airships which is fully powered the aerostat which is powered only for no. okay only for local applications and then 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 there is a hot air balloon so today we are going to look at a balloon okay we are not going to look at airships or aerostat today that much observation balloons are not new they have been used since many many years for example there was a battle of floris in 1794 where the armed forces deployed a balloon with a person on board with binoculars to just look at what is happening at the enemy then in 1912 germans came up with the parsival sixfeld sixfeld type balloon you can see that there are lots of people on the ground holding this cable this particular balloon was further improved to a kakwe type kite balloon and this you can see the number of people are not immediately going to reduce but they are fewer in number and then we have the worldwide world world worldwide or worldwide worldwide la uh, world war first german observation balloon okay so let us look at now the story of the mischievous chinese balloon what happened what went wrong and what is it these are all my own views based on the literature which i have obtained i do not claim to know the exact story and the detailed story so please pardon me if something on this proves proved to be wrong the chinese balloon was seen to be just a simple structure consisting of three major components the envelope which is the bag that houses the lta gas the solar panels in this case which provide the power to the system and the payload or the gondola in which we keep the safety devices and the payload carrying payload carrying uh, material like sweaters jackets etc and whatever the that's all okay the balloon was quite large one estimate was that it was almost as high as three double story buses so each double story bus is approximately 20 meters in height So three of them would be sixty meters in dia. So the balloon was almost the same dia as the Opera House, which is only point eight five meters dia. This would have been really huge, point four eight centimeters. Okay, let's go ahead. it was an unpowered balloon so its path was followed purely by the path of the ambient air so this is the answer to one of the questions yes it is possible to put propulsive devices onto a balloon to make it come back to the open look uh, to the original location but our preliminary studies have shown that this particular configuration and battery the weight is going to be far more than the budget that you have Shekhar, we'll just go ahead. This balloon was of 113 cubic meters volume. It's more than half the volume of the famous Hindenburg airship. Very large volume. Okay, 
Now, four of them were detected over the US airspace. Let us look at the timeline. And these are the four instances. The first one took place on 4th of February at Myrtle Beach. There was a balloon observed at a height of 60,000 feet, size of a small car, which was over Alaska in the US. Then we had a cylindrical balloon over the Yukon. And finally, we had an octagonal system deployed over Michigan. Fortunately, this system had balloon strings attached. It was possible to bring it down and to observe the contents. Okay. So let's look at the trajectory of the first Chinese balloon. By using very high altitude modeling data, not by me, this is the report from the BBC, but lo looking at the scientific data of the wind patterns in India at that time of the year, at that day of the year, etc., it was predicted that the balloon will follow like this. It will go from India to South China, then it will go to the sea. So this is the close-up. It entered from Alaska, the US territory, but it took quite some time before we could realize that it's a unknown flying object. Then it entered into Canada. In Canada, there was a proposal to shoot it down, but it did not materialize. It took time to figure out. By that time, things were figured out. The balloon came back to US territory. And then finally, when it came to Montana near the US uh, Army base, there they asked, what the hell do you think you are doing? So he said, I'm just a tourist. And they literally gorged his eyes out and, you know, really troubled that person. So on 28th January, it enters the U.S. airspace through Alaska, but no one acknowledges even the U.S. On 30th June, after two days, it enters the Canadian airspace. One day later, it floats over U.S. airspace in Idaho. Now, at this point of time, U.S. thought, well, now it is a good time to, because it is entering our territory, it is a good time to shoot it down. But they were, were, they were a bit concerned about it. So they want to shoot it down, but they consider against it. On 1st February, it flew near the Montana Air Force Base, and then the U.S. became very, U.S. became very, very concerned, because now it is flying near the air base. So then they said we should take action. And uh, on the next day, on 2nd February, the US disclosed that the balloon has been flying in US airspace for a quite long time. Finally, on 4th of February, the balloon was shot down. So for six days, there was no inkling about the balloon. No discussion, no talk. On the sixth day, I gave no. Now, what happened after the balloon was shot down? First thing is that the U.S. Secretary of State, Sri Anthony, Mr. Anthony Blinken, he postponed his visit to China. On 4th February, the U.S. decides to shoot other balloons also down. After about a week, after about six days, China says, oh, it is an overreaction. Those were just some civilian weather balloon. We launched hundreds of them. It has gone haywire and got caught in the wind and came here. After a few days, China accuses US of flying hot air balloons or high altitude balloons over its airspace more than 10 times since 2022. So a counter argument has started. At the end of the event, essentially it was shot down and this is the image of the grabbing of the
So, uh, the U.S. considers the balloon as a threat to its nation, and therefore it shot it down. Uh, during investigation, it was found that certain Chinese companies were involved. So, six aerospace companies of Chinese origin based in the U.S. have been, uh, you know, sanctioned against, right? And uh, as I said, China also accused that U.S. has been gathering intelligence via balloon over many, many years. As a result of this, the relationship between U.S. and China have become very worse. And even continues even now. There have been other places where such vehicles have been sighted. For example, in India, there was a balloon sighted over Port Blair in January last year. Six balloons apparently have been shot down by the Ukraine, which belong to Russia. The U.S. forces in the Middle East also claim that they fought they located a Chinese hot air balloon floating through the fall of 2022. In short, the U.S. forces have shot down four unidentified balloons over the last two years, including one over Canadian airspace. And that already I have described to you. The latest sighting of a hot air balloon, um, high altitude balloon, has been in Hawaii. On the left-hand side, you can see some kind of a warning issued by the air traffic control authorities. Report of large white balloon in the vicinity of so-and-so, estimated to be between flight level 4,000, that means 40,000 feet, and flight level 500, which means 50,000 feet. Precise altitude unknown, advise ATC if object is seen. And the pilot says, Roger, that means he acknowledges and he says, I will do it. This alert was issued early morning on 20th of February, local time, and we don't have further details. This is the predicted trajectory of this particular balloon based on the wind data. You can see that the altitude is fluctuating between approximately 13,500 feet to 14,500 feet. These fluctuations can be intentional or they could be purely based on the loss in the buoyancy because of changes in the ambient conditions like temperature. We come now to the question of balloons versus satellite for surveillance. Which one is better? Balloons are closer to the Earth. They fly at approximately 11 miles. They are far less expensive. They cost only a few thousand dollars. And balloons do not add to the problem of space debris, which is the, one of the burning problems of space technology in the, in the whole world. Satellite, on the other hand, even if it is a lower satellite, it will be around 100 kilometers or 62 miles from the Earth. But they are far, far more expensive. A typical satellite is costing about 400 million USD as against few thousand dollars cost of the high altitude balloon. As I mentioned, we know from the literature that a missile was fired from F-22 AM-9X 500 missile. So the reason for that is very clear that the maximum altitude of this aircraft is approximately 10 miles from Earth. whereas that was over 52,800 feet. The balloon was seen to operate at 65,000, which is about two and a half, 2.31 miles above, or 12,250 feet above. So how will you shoot it down? How will the range be there? Because you cannot. This particular aircraft has a 20 mm rotary gun called M61A2. Its range is only 2,000 feet whereas the balloon was at 12,200 feet, so you could not have used the rotary cannon. The missile which was used is the cheapest and the smallest air-to-air -air missile available to the U.S., although it costs a lot of money, but that is the only thing which is, uh, that is the cheapest thing which is available in the missile category. And this is one grab from a video that was shared. I don't know whether it is true or false, because it seemed very unrealistic to me at least. But it just shows 
the aircraft flying below the balloon. What are the takeaways of these incidents, both for the US and for China? For the US, since they used an F-22 aircraft to shoot down this particular balloon, the cost of operation of this aircraft per hour is $68,000. And one missile will cost approximately $400,000. So close to $470,000 were spent by the US. The cost of balloon available easily in South Carolina is around $10,000. And possibly it collected the sensitive information because nobody is sure about it. Because the US government has not shared what kind of payload was recovered apart from solar panels. Okay, so that's all I wanted to discuss with you today. Thank you very much. And now I'm open for questions. So if anybody has any questions or any queries, please ask them on the chat window so that we can address them. We have around 20 minutes more remaining. So the floor is open. Please ask your queries. And that will allow us to go ahead. So the floor is open for any query that you may have. So we are just waiting for your queries, friends. If there are no queries for about three minutes, then I'm just going to stop this interactive session. Yes, no more. If there are no queries, then we can wind up the session. So we will wait for another couple of minutes. If there are no queries, then we will say goodbye. Already it is around 5.38. Prachi has a question. How many days it took for the balloon to travel from China to USA? How the endurance was achieved? And from launch point, do it flow at the same altitude? So no, Prachi, the balloon did not fly at the same altitude. The balloon was subjected to upward and lower uh, winds prevailing in the atmosphere. Sometimes there is some claim that these were deliberately brought up and down. But uh, the time taken, as per my information, is around, uh, around 10 days. But I'm not very really sure about the exact number. A week to 10 days it was it took. So it doesn't fly the same altitude. Depending on the buoyancy condition, it can go up and down. But during the deployment time, the, the whole thing is, uh, you know, the weather changes. So it will not be at the same altitude. It will be at various altitudes. Okay. The endurance was achieved because it was just uh, flying with the prevailing wind. This balloon has no propulsion system. So it flies only where the wind takes it. So what they do is they release the balloon in such a way that it goes to the height where the winds are very heavy. And then the wind is basically pushing the balloon. So it's a free flight. But sometimes it may go a little bit up and down also. It could be because of buoyancy differences. Or it could be because of leakage of gas, because of heating of the gas. Or it could be natural drift which is there for every object that flies in atmosphere. But what you say is right, that if there was a serious issue, the hair would have been 
a telltale, you know, giveaway of that. Okay, any more questions to do with what I spoke or to do with the course or anything else to do with LTF systems or aerospace engineering in general? I'll be happy to answer them. So guys, don't hesitate with your doubts because the more you ask the questions, the more enriched both you and me become. Otherwise, I'm, you know, I'm falling asleep as you can see. Because of the lack of interaction, talking to a, you know, screen, I get a little bit bored. And because of that, sometimes you will find me dipping my head and going into a slumber. That's only because it's very, very boring and dull to interact in an air-conditioned room with a screen. So we will wait for your questions. And uh, if there are no questions, then we will wind up. Okay, looks like there are no further questions. So it's time for us to say goodbye and stop today's session. Good luck with the course and use the discussion forum for asking all your questions. And thanks, Naman, for coordinating the session from Tiruvananthapuram. Thanks and 